Hi, I'm Jade. I'm a medical student in Leicester. In today's video, we will cover everything a medical student should know about the service. First, let's talk about some of the basics of the cervix. What is the cervix? The cervix is the lower part of the uterus that connects the uterus to the vagina. It's made up of the endocervix, which is more proximal and lined with simple columnar epithelium, and the ectocervix, which communicates with the vagina and is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. The transformation zone is where the endocervix meets the ectocervix, and where cells have undergone metaplasia to become squamous epithelium. It can be visualized as there's a change in color from the pale, pink, shiny, smooth surface of the endocervix to the reddish, granular appearance of the ectocervical canal. The transformation zone is the most common site for the development of cervical SCC, or squamous cell carcinoma. Now let's talk about the cervical screening program in the UK. Why do we have a cervical screening program? Well, it saves lives. In fact, cervical screening is said to prevent at least 2,000 deaths due to cervical cancer every year in the UK. Yet, Cancer Research UK states that in 2015, 99.8% of cases of cervical cancer were preventable. There are still around 850 cervical cancer deaths in the UK every year, which is more than two every day. Cervical screening picks up pre-malignant changes which can progress to cancer, rather than detecting the cancer itself. But cervical screening rates are dropping slowly. 3 in 10 women do not accept their invitations for cervical screening. Hey, are you one of those three? Who qualifies for the program? And when do they get screened? All people with a cervix between the ages of 24 and a half and 65 will be called for a routine cervical screening every three years between the ages of 25 and 49, and then every five years from age 50 to 64. People with a cervix who are 65 or older will also qualify for routine cervical screening if they recently had an abnormal cervical smear or if they have not had a smear since 50 years of age and they request one. Cervical screening is usually postponed in patients who are menstruating, less than 12 weeks postpartum, post-termination of pregnancy or miscarriage, patients with abnormal vaginal discharge or pelvic infection, and finally in patients who are pregnant, unless the previous test was abnormal. In this case, seek specialist advice. What actually is the screening process? Usually, the routine cervical screening process involves visualizing the cervix using a speculum and then taking a sample from the whole of the transformation zone. The sample is then sent off to the lab with some preservative fluid to keep the cells viable. This is usually done in primary care or in sexual health clinics by trained individuals. Cells in the sample taken are tested for HPV. If HPV is not detected, then no further tests are done and the patient returns to the routine screening program. If HPV is detected, then cytology is performed to look for abnormal cells. If abnormal cells are identified, then the patient is referred for colposcopy. Colposcopy is done if the patient has cervical stenosis, if their cervix cannot be visualized, if there have been three consecutive inadequate cervical cytology samples, if abnormal cells were visualized on cytology, or if an abnormal cervix was seen on performing a cervical smear test. Colposcopy is done in secondary care. In colposcopy, first the cervix is visualized using a speculum and inspected in detail using the colposcope to look for abnormal changes. Then chemicals are applied to the cervix, like acetic acid to stain abnormal areas white and iodine to stain normal tissue dark brown. Biopsies may also be taken. Next, let's talk about HPV. The human papillomavirus is a very prevalent sexually transmitted virus that affects the skin and mucous membranes. HPV infection is the most important risk factor for developing CIN and then cervical cancer, in particular the subtypes 16 and 18. The other most common subtypes, that is 6 and 11, are non-carcinogenic and associated with genital warts. Usually, HPV infections self-resolve within two years, but if they persist, then this increases the risk of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and cervical cancer. Have you heard of the HPV vaccination? The HPV vaccination protects people from HPV 16 and 18, which both increase the risk of cervical cancer, as well as 6 and 11. 
It has been given to girls aged 12 to 13 since 2008, but since 2018, it's been offered to girls as well as boys of the same age too. So what is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia? CIN is a premalignant lesion detected by colposcopy. CIN1 is when the lower third of the surface layer of the cervix is affected. In CIN2, the lower and middle thirds are affected. And in CIN3, which is also known as high-grade dysplasia, the full thickness of the surface layer is affected. CIN2 or 3 can progress to cervical cancer if left untreated. Women with CIN should be encouraged and supported to stop smoking. Persistent CIN1, CIN2 and 3 are treated with excisional biopsy or ablation of the transformation zone either on the first assessment or following abnormal punch biopsy results. Excisional biopsy options include large loop excision of the transformational zone, cone biopsy or even hysterectomy if there are other gynecological problems or if local excision failed. Ablative options include cryotherapy, laser ablation and cold coagulation. Women who have been treated for CIN 1, 2 or 3 should be invited for a test of cure repeat cytology six months after treatment. Next, let's talk about cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is quite common. In fact, in females in the UK, cervical cancer is the 14th most common cancer, with around 3,000 new cases in 2017. Most cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinomas caused by persistent HPV infection, and about 15% are adenocarcinomas. Risk factors for developing cervical cancer include smoking, STIs, long-term use of the COCP, immunodeficiency, early first intercourse, many sexual partners, and a lower socioeconomic status. Patients with cervical cancer are usually totally asymptomatic and may be picked up on routine screening. Some symptoms, however, include postcoital, intermenstrual or postmenopausal PV bleeding, blood-stained or foul-smelling vaginal discharge, dyspareunia, pelvic pain, and weight loss. Late symptoms include painless hematuria and altered bowel habit. For patients with any of the above symptoms, it's important to perform a speculum examination, a bimanual examination to rule out differential diagnoses for symptoms, and a GI examination to look for hydronephrosis, bladder distension, and masses. Test for chlamydia, particularly if the patient complains about abnormal vaginal bleeding, and other STIs if clinically indicated. Consider referring the patient for colposcopy if the cervix appears abnormal, for biopsy of dysplastic areas of the cervix, diagnosis and management. Refer any patient with unexplained postmenopausal bleeding for an urgent gynaecology review. After confirmation of the diagnosis, baseline bloods will be done, a CT chest abdo pelvis should be requested to look for metastases, particularly in the common sites like lung, breast, bowel and bone, and further examination and biopsies may be required under general anaesthetic. The FIGO staging is used for cervical cancer. Stage 0 refers to carcinoma in situ. Stage 1 is when the cancer is confined to the cervix. Stage 2 is either when the cancer extends beyond the cervix but not all the way to the pelvic wall, or it involves the upper two-thirds of the vagina. Stage 3 is when the cancer either extends to the pelvic sidewall, involves the lower third of the vagina, or when the patient has unexplained hydronephrosis. Stage 4, which is associated with a poor prognosis, is when the cancer extends beyond the pelvis and involves distant sites, or it involves the bladder or rectum or both. Patients are referred to and managed by a multidisciplinary team. Management options include surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy, although often a combination of these options is used. Treatment options depend on the stage of the cervical cancer, patient's general premorbid status and comorbidities, as well as patient preference. Some surgical options are a radical trachelectomy, which involves removal of the cervix and the upper vagina and preserves fertility, laparoscopic hysterectomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy, radical hysterectomy, which involves the removal of the uterus, vagina, parametrial tissues up to the pelvic sidewall and the pelvic lymph nodes, and exenteration or pelvic clearance, which is the removal of the internal reproductive organs, that is the uterus, cervix, ovaries and vagina, and potentially parts or all of the bladder, rectum, urethra or anus.
Radiotherapy is an alternative to surgery in the early stages of the disease, but it can also be used in conjunction with chemotherapy. Cisplatin-based chemotherapy can be used as a neoadjuvant therapy, adjuvant therapy, or as part of palliative care treatment. Finally, let's talk about some other cervical conditions. Cervical ectropion is where there is metaplasia of the cells of the ectocervix, from stratified squamous to simple columnar epithelium. This occurs as a result of elevated estrogen levels due to pregnancy, use of the COCP, or just naturally being in the ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle. It's a benign condition, but as patients may present with excessive vaginal discharge, intermenstrual or postcoital bleeding, and the cervix appears abnormal on speculum examination, patients with suspected cervical ectropion may still be referred to gynecology to exclude CIN and cervical cancer if there is a high clinical suspicion. If patients present with postmenopausal bleeding, then they must be referred urgently to gynecology. Treatment is not required unless the patient is symptomatic, in which case estrogen-containing medications should be stopped, and if symptoms persist, then ablation of the columnar epithelium can be performed. A cervical polyp is a benign growth protruding from the cervix, caused by focal hyperplasia of the columnar epithelium of the endocervix. Polyps are usually asymptomatic, and identified during routine cervical screening, although some patients report abnormal vaginal bleeding and increased vaginal discharge. Investigations include histological examination of the polyp for confirmation of the diagnosis, a cervical smear to rule out CIN, and triple swabs to rule out STIs if clinically indicated. Ultrasound scan of the endometrial cavity may also be done if symptoms persist after the polyp is removed, as endometrial polyps can be associated with cervical polyps. There is a small risk of malignant transformation of the polyps, which is why cervical polyps are usually removed, even if the patient is totally asymptomatic. Small polyps are removed using polypectomy forceps in primary care, while large polyps are removed using a diaphermy loop excision or under GA in secondary care. Thanks for watching, and hey, go to your routine cervical screening appointment.